joy. That's the title of what I want to talk about this morning. So, and I tried to type out what I wanted to say so that I wouldn't get too sidetracked and wouldn't keep you all day. So anyway, but as a child, we used to have children's church and it was basically right here, almost in this exact spot where I'm standing right now. And the teacher then was Mrs. Margaret Gregg. And she was a very stern lady and we were not allowed to talk when she was speaking. But therefore I do remember what she said because I had to listen. If you didn't listen, you would get told on and you would get spanking. So <laughs> you sat there and you listened to what Miss Craig had to say. Um, she passed away this year and I pray that she found the joy that she would, was searching for her whole life. Um, but once I remember she took a cup of water, a clear cup of water, and I was so fascinated because she kept putting little drops of food coloring in it and it would change a different color and she would talk about what yellow meant, what green meant. But when you put all those colors together, the water would turn black. And so at the end, she would put a little drop of, I think it was Clorox in it. She would turn the water white again or clear again. And she would talk about how all those sins, um, how the water turned dark from our sins, but then one drop of God's mercy would make it all better. And I remember that. But I always remember she used to have these little felt backdrops. You might remember the felt backdrops. Um, Sister Glenda Parker was my first Sunday school teacher before we came here. She had felt backdrops. Miss Greg had felt backdrops and all my other Sunday school teachers, and they stuck the little men on it um, and the little women when they would tell the little Bible stories. But they were powerful because I remember them. So I have a felt backdrop, and I'm hoping it works. I mean, we're on live Facebook. So if it doesn't work, just remember the felt backdrops from a long time ago. But one Christmas Sunday morning, I will never forget because the story that she told has been 35 years and I still remember it. But one Christmas, she talked about joy. And I remember this message. And so I wanted to share a little bit of what Miss Greg shared with me 35 or more probably, more years ago. But she said the key to having joy was to put Jesus first in your life. And I felt like I could not, not like disagree with that. So... I thought that we should put Jesus in our life first, and I'm hoping, goodness. If I get it backwards, y'all fuss at me. Y'all tell me because I'm looking backwards. Is that right? Okay. If it falls down, be graceful this morning. All right, so she talked a lot about Jesus. And then she said that all we had to do to have joy was to put others second right after Jesus that's what she said and then she said the way to have joy was to make sure that you put yourself last that is a terrible out it's okay y'all got it right bless it she said that if you would have joy, you'd have to consider yourself last. In order to have joy, that was the only way you could have joy. And it was in that order. Jesus, others, yourself. Keep it in that order and you'll have joy. I remember her saying that. Um, and I think that it's ingrained in me. But lately, I'm honestly drained sometimes <laughs> for putting myself last. And I might have misunderstood what she said. I might have been too young to get the whole meaning. But I'm finding that in that order all the time isn't exactly 100% correct, though it's a very good thought and it is biblical, but you know, you have to rightly divide, you know. And I know what she meant and I appreciate the lesson. But you know, me being a teacher, I looked it up. Joy is a noun, a noun is a person, place, or thing. And I'd say Joy is not a person, though I do have a childhood friend who was very special to me and her name was Joy. Joy is not a place, though I do know some people like myself who can get real joyful at the beach and others of you get joyful at the mountains. So I'm pretty sure that since I can't touch it or hold it, that though I can't touch it or hold it, that joy is a thing um, because it's not a person, it's not a place. And over the past few years, I've heard a very common saying, just choose joy. How easy is that? Just, I'm, fa I'm sad. Someone died. I lost my job. I don't have enough money. My bills are behind. Whatever. I'm just going to choose joy. It sounds so easy, but it's really not. Let's just be real. It's not. It's a great slogan, but it's not always easy. But when I see that sign, choose joy, I always think of what Miss Griggs said. Jesus, others, and yourself, and then you'll be joyful. And so I wonder, how do you choose joy? How do you do it? 
I do not disagree that joy is Jesus first. I do not. And I absolutely agree because the Bible backs that up. It says Proverbs 3 and 6 proclaims, In everything you do, put God first, and he will direct you and crown your efforts with efforts with success. So if we want to be successful, put Jesus first, and he's going to crown your efforts with success. The problem is we don't always define success the way Jesus does, and that's a lesson for a different day. But just know that when you've got God first, that is success in your life. Matthew 6 and 33 says that we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So what is righteousness? It is also a noun. It's the quality of being morally right and justifiable. And so what is God's righteousness? Because you seek him first in his righteousness. So that's a deeper spiritual meaning, and righteousness is the quality of being right in the eyes of God, including our character or our nature, our conscience or our attitude, our conduct or our actions, and then our commands, our word, and then his command, his word. So the Bible, what the Bible means is that we are to put God's concerns ahead of our own or to seek his purpose with all of our heart. And when we do that, Jesus says the rest of our life will take care of itself. So does that mean that we're guaranteed a perfectly smooth life in all other ways, no problems ever? Not exactly. It means that if you give yourself to God's cause, rather than fretting about your own personal needs, <clears throat> that he will make sure that you have all of the, that you need so that you can do the will of the Father and glorify him. Because sometimes we forget that our whole purpose here is to do the will of the Father and glorify him, to give God praise, honor, and glory. <clears throat> So many people in the Bible did right in the sight of the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. They were righteous people, and they lived to seek and bring God joy and to seek after his righteousness. <coughs> but that's also a lesson for a different day. So we'll get back to what we're speaking about today, which is joy. So Ms. Grigg said others were next. The second component of the acronym, it stands for others. Philippians 2, 3, and 4 says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others before yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And it goes on to say that your attitude should be the same as Christ Jesus. That one's high and hard to me. Who, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God to be something to be grasped, but he made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance of a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Sorry, I told you I wrote it down, so I'd stay with it. So I think the other O could stand for obedience, because there's joy in obedience. And Jesus um, was obedient to his Father when he put others first, definitely by coming here and dying on the cross and raising again and all the things, especially the crucifixion, was definitely obedience and putting others first. But I do think that we need some caution and wisdom here. If you're going to constantly pour yourself into others and not take care of yourself, you are going to run out of steam, and you're going to be ineffective. So I think that J is big, but the O and Y is kind of equal in a lot of ways, and I do have some scriptures to explain. But um, Tim, he flew to Michigan for Christmas to visit his dad and his family, and I'm so glad that he had that opportunity. But I'm sure when he got on the airplane yesterday that the flight attendant came out and said, hey, there's a possibility this plane is going to crash. And if it does, it's going to start to go down. And if it does, there's going to be some things drop down. And be sure you put your oxygen mask on first because the oxygen will deplete quickly except for what's in the tanks. And if you pass out, you can't help anybody. Now, I always argued that if the plane crashes, I'm not sure how much the two minutes of breathing was going to do anyway. Just I'd rather pass out first and then die. But, you know, um, you got to put your own oxygen on before you can help anybody else. Um, but let's talk about the same is true in life because I think Jesus actually modeled putting his own oxygen on first if you look at Scripture. He rested on multiple occasions. Um, and it must have been important because he included it in the Bible. And if it were not important, if rest was just not important, he would have just left it out altogether. Because I do believe the Bible speaks of only the important things. And so it doesn't waste time on nuances. I mean, all the little details, it wasn't important or that wouldn't be in there. So what's in the Bible is what's important. Um, but the Bible, if rest wasn't important, then the Bible would have just went from story of servanthood to servanthood to servanthood to servanthood to servanthood and never had any speaking of rest. But rest is something that God modeled and ordained. Satan, on the other hand, models busyness. 
He goes to and fro day and night, and he never rests. He never stops. He's always going, and he's always tormented. And so the question is, who do you want to model your life after? Do you want to model your life after a God who tries to model rest for you? Or do you want to model your life after your enemy who says constant busyness is good? Rest is never described as an active event and doing something that used energy like a vacation or amusement park or a recreational event. Those are fun things, but that's not rest. Rest is being still. Rest is being still. Psalm 46 and 10 says, be still and know that I am God. So God created a whole day that we're supposed to do nothing but rest. It's the Sabbath, the one we're in right now. I tried to encourage my sister to rest some this morning. She wouldn't listen. She's busy. So we've made a mockery of the Sabbath in our society, just to be honest. Sundays are so full that they're almost exhausting sometimes. And I'm not sure we have the idea of the Sabbath right at all. Again, another story for another day. But on this busy, busy, busy day, Christmas Eve, what if I assigned you, as a teacher, I assigned you two hours of rest today? You are to rest with God, period. You are to have no phone, no others, just you, your Bible, a comfy place, a chair, a bed, whatever, a comfy place, you and God, two hours. That's your assignment. You have to rest. I wonder how many of you would say the dog ate your homework. You couldn't do it. You had something else you had to do today. You just could not do it. Um, when Jesus went away to rest, it was so he could rejuvenate. He often spent time with his father and he prayed, and then he was able to continue ministry. So to prepare for a major task, um, Jesus would always rest and pray and spend time with God. So Luke 4, 1 and 2 and 14 and 15 says, After Jesus was baptized, he spent 40 days praying in the wilderness. After this, he was tempted of Satan, but then he, began, he was able to begin his public ministry after he rested 40 days. 40 days. To recharge after a hard day of work in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus um, sent the 12 disciples out to do ministry, but when they returned, he encouraged them to separate from the people who were following them so they could rest. To work through grief in Matthew chapter 14, after Jesus learned that his cousin John the Baptist had been beheaded, he went away by himself to pray and rest. Yes, so even the Son of God grieves, and the way he got through it was to rest. Just rest. Um... Recently, my Aunt Kay passed away, and I tried to help my cousin Dennis through a few things. And I called him. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm just out here walking around Mom and Dad's house. I said, you want me to come over? He said, no. I just want to sit here and rest. He said, it's, it's good for me to think about all the good things by myself. So even though he's not in church every Sunday, I do believe he has a kind heart. In it, and he's actually right on that. Stop and rest. I don't want to work. I don't want to clean it up. I don't want to order food. I don't want to plan the funeral. I just want to be here for a minute and rest. But before making any important decisions, Jesus models rest. In Luke chapter 6, verse 12 and 13, it says, Early in his ministry, he spent a whole night, a whole night alone and in prayer. And the next day, he chose 12 disciples after he rested. You can't do things if you're constantly busy. You cannot keep a straight mind if you're constantly busy. Um, in time of distress, in Luke 22, 39 through 44, just hours before Jesus was going to be arrested and taken and, and crucified on the Mount of Olives, he just was a short distance away, he took his disciples away to pray, and he was in great emotional agony knowing he was getting ready to be crucified. But to do the, wi the will and the mission of God, he had to first rest. So rest is a... Rest and focus on prayer. And like in Luke 5, 16, many times Jesus spent time alone in prayer and resting so however jesus did not he definitely did put others ahead of his own but he often took time to rest and pray so that he could effectively serve others so for the o and others we cannot really serve others effectively until we do the same thing and take care of yourself so like miss craig said it stands for yourself but exercise is also a part of that. So, you know, resting, yes. But we also have to take care of our bodies. God gave us these bodies, and we have to take care of them. Um, I remember Tommy going on a diet, I think, last year and losing like 40 pounds in a year because he realized he needed to take care of his body because you can't just keep going in a bad direction all the time. Go, 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 go. Eat, 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 eat. <laughs> you got to stop and rest and take care of yourself. The Bible does instruct us to take care of ourselves. It is one of the fruit of the Spirit. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit, but also self-control. 1 Corinthians 9.25 talks about the athlete, and I thought about that because I have a couple athletes in my house, um, three, but not me. Um, but they have discipline and training so that they can compete 
um, they have strict training so that they can win the crown, a crown that will pass away, a reward, a prize, first place. Um, but we're to practice good health too so that we can have strength for the journey and serving the Lord and in ministry so that we can win the crown that will never go away. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You're not your own. You were bought with a price, and therefore it is a command to honor God with your bodies. And that means take care of yourself. Take care of yourself as being godly, just taking care of yourself. The Bible says to love others as yourself. Um, and so what does that look like? You know, not, not love others more than yourself, to love your others as as you love yourself do unto others as you would have them do unto you not do unto others better than you would have them do unto you just treat people the way you want to be treated and love others the way you want to be loved the niv translation of first corinthians 13 says love projects in philippians 2 and 4 it says let each of you look not only to his own interest but the interest of others loving your neighbor as yourself is to look at other people's well-being not to like try to please them all the time but just to wish them well and to try to treat others kindly and respectfully Considering the needs of others before your own is biblical, but others and yourself are about on the same level in many scriptures. Meaning you absolutely cannot take care of others if you haven't taken care of yourself. I spoke to some people recently, several of my friends, and they're talking about the events that are getting ready to happen at their house tonight and tomorrow. If I can just get through that, I'll be okay. Because they're busy serving other people, and they haven't taken any time to serve themselves and to pray and rest in God. So... We have to take care of ourselves so that we can take care of others. And if we take care of ourselves for ourselves, then we, so that we can serve ourselves, we end up with the satisfying, we, that's unsatisfactory and we want more. If we're taking care of ourselves for me, so I can do for me, after a while that gets old too. So, I mean, if you keep that balance. But again, Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition and gain, or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves or as yourselves. So if you're looking for joy this season, remember you have to keep Jesus first. There's no question about that. Um, consider others, but take care of yourself so that you can effectively do all that God's called you to do. Many of you are going to host family members who are not right with God. And if you're so much in a tizzy, you can't even be joyful and happy and just mad the whole time. What in the world do they see Jesus in you? They don't care. You know, they're just like, yeah, I, don't need any, I was happier before I got over here. So be sure that you're showing Jesus in all that you do. According to Psalm 51 and 12, God can also restore joy. So if you're like, I don't have any joy, um, God can restore joy. In that verse in 51 and 12, David says, through prayer, that's the why, taking care of yourself, um, and, and the J, putting Jesus first, that he asked God to put the joy back in him. In Psalm 16 and 11, it says, so you can have a fullness of joy, that when you get in his presence, again, the Y and the J, um, you take yourself away for a minute so that you can spend time with God. Psalm 97 and 11 says that we can have joy when we do what's right and when you have our heart right. Joy is a result of righteousness, according to that verse. And again, that is serving Jesus and taking care of yourself. Proverbs 10, 28 says the hope of righteousness brings joy. And when we do what's right and anticipate God's goodness in our lives, we will experience joy. John 16 and 24 says joy is full when we have when we have an answered prayer so when you spend time before the lord and you ask him things and then he answers a prayer that's when your joy gets full you're like look at god look at god answering all my prayers galatians 5 22 says joy is a fruit that is produced by the holy spirit and that spending time with god produces the fruit of the spirit which includes joy so philippians 1 3 through 5 speaks about having joy when we remember all that the lord has done it's impossible to look back and say look at all these victories i'm so sad about them they just make me sad. <laughs> I mean, when you look back at what God's done in your life and the successes that you've had in your life, it brings joy. Psalms 40 and 4 says there's joy in those who trust in the Lord. So I've heard that phrase, choose joy. Why wouldn't we do that? Why wouldn't we spend time with the Lord and rest? Um, if joy is an actual something, it makes sense to choose it over other things that aren't joyful. 
but sometimes we don't have the option because we get thrown into something that's not joyful. Um, you know, last week, one of my friend's mother passed away, and he's been really struggling because by her own testimony, he's not sure if her if she's now in the presence of the Lord. So he's struggling with that a little bit. So there are times when you don't have an option of something unjoyful being thrown at you. Um, like I said, a couple of weeks ago, my Aunt Kay passed away. Dennis found himself being the last one in his family, playing in a funeral, and he's the only one left. That's not joyful. That's hard. Tim has customers at the shop that tell him about things that they go through and cancers and people in their family that have died. And, and we realize that our community, outside of our church, our community, we have 6,000 customers up there, and they come in with some stories. And so our community also struggles to have joy. But So I do think it's a good enough thought to just choose joy, but I do think it is harder. But I think you have to do it the biblical way. Put Jesus first, and others and yourself is almost on an equal plane. Being unselfish is not the same as having joy. So if I had something and you wanted it, I want to serve you. I've seen my mom give shoes away that she was wearing to church, give rings away that she had on in church because someone said they liked it. That's, that's being unselfish and not having, um, like, a huge emphasis on me 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 but serving others that that takes out of you so you've got to put things back into you even Jesus modeled that but where I was going with that is Isaiah 53 and 3 says that even Jesus is a man of sorrow I mean he was acquainted with grief. he felt he felt sadness he felt pain and things that his flesh didn't want to go through but he had to constantly choose joy by going away with his father and praying and spending time alone with the Lord um, Hebrews 12 and 2 lets us know that Jesus was a man of faith, but not necessarily a man of joy. The verse says, For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. He knew in the end that he would have joy, but he also knew the incredible pain between the present and the joy that was coming and what he would have to go through to get to the joy to be seated at the right hand of his father, God. So a couple years ago, I went to a ladies' conference, and the, the theme was joy in the journey. And the lady who led it, she was super happy. She had the world by string and she was so like all you gotta do is choose, choose joy there's joy in the journey and if you're not joyful you're almost in it <laughs> and I just felt like man she's got it all together I need to be more like her but in the weeks and months after that her husband passed away of a heart attack and now she's far from God and not that it's a terrible thing to take medicine but she takes medication every day just to deal with the day she takes medication to get up medication to go to sleep medication all day long because she's lost the joy that she had in that journey um so, again, not say anything bad about her, but I wonder, where was her joy to begin with? So, it is Christmas Eve, and it is the most wonderful time of the year. I've spent a lot of time out in public this week, and I have to say that I'm not sure everyone out there knows it's the most wonderful time of the year, because there's some people that are just not happy out there right now. So, I was thinking about joy... Um, and seeing so little of it, I started trying to remember how to get joy according to the scriptures. And of course, I thought about the angel who came to Mary and said, Behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And then I thought how Mary must have felt trying to explain to her parents and her fiancé that she was pregnant. And I wonder if she felt joy. Or if she felt scared or confused or lonely. And I wonder if she, was, if she absolutely knew the child was a miracle birth. Why did she have a hard time with it? Because life is hard. Life is super hard. But even in that, she said, Be it under me according to thy will. And she found joy in the process of serving others and bringing the Savior of the world to us. So Mary found joy, and here's the O again, in obedience. So she had to be obedient even when the circumstances were not optimal. So... Our obedience releases Christ's joy within us. John 15 11 says, I have told you this so that you may have joy and that in your joy it might be complete. That's why he told you. So there, are great, there is great joy in abiding in Christ. True joy does not originate from us. It is generated by the circumstances in our lives and how we choose to look at them. So true joy comes from Christ, the victorious Son of God, and he wants to share this joy with us. This is the season that celebrates his birth, and soon we'll celebrate his death and his resurrection. And the best news is that he is already seated at the right hand of the Father God, and he has found that joy that was spoken of in Hebrews, the joy that, is set, that then was set before him. So you will have to endure to the end just like he did and be obedient for whatever the Lord has called you to do so that you too can have joy. 
The psalmist wrote, Joyful are those who obey his laws and search for him with their whole heart. That's Psalm uh, 119 and 2, if you're asking. Psalm 30 and 5 tells us that God's anger, that about God's anger, but it's just for a moment, but his favor is a lifetime. And it goes on to say that your weeping might endure for the night, but joy comes in the morning. So there is joy set before us. Um, that verse lets me, though, that I'm going to go through things in my life and it's not always going to be fun but I have to always choose to please God and in pleasing God and enduring through whatever I have to deal with that is where I will be obedient and find the joy um when you mess up just ask for forgiveness so that you can be back in his favor why wouldn't you do that just say God I'm sorry I really don't want to be like this I want to have all this tension and turmoil in my life I want to have joy I want to be obedient so mom if you'll come but today and tonight and tomorrow, as we celebrate Christmas, try to remember Jesus is the real reason for this season. And if you'll put him first, you will have joy. This other stuff kind of falls in line behind, but just always put Jesus first so you'll have joy. Because Jesus is the real and the only reason for the season. So why wouldn't we put him first above the dinners and the cakes and the shopping and the presents and and the family, all the things, put him first. And I, I, it's not an assignment, but if you would find a way to rest in him this afternoon, you might find some peace and rest and joy in the season. So we do need to serve others, but please don't forget about yourself. That's where I wanted to go with this. Go rest, and by that I mean spend some quality time with God so that you can be thankful for the ultimate Christmas gift that you've been given, and then you can share with others the true meaning of Christmas and share the true joy of Christmas. Um, and you can tell them how they can also receive Jesus, and then they can begin to serve others and themselves through the word and through prayer and experience joy so if you would just stand i thought we could sing this song on our way out because um and maybe if you wanted to pray you could but i really wasn't going to call you to the altar i was going to call you to go home and rest because i think that that's what the lord would have you to do he would have you to just rest in him so sing with me joy to the world and then i'll turn it over to tommy and we'll head out to celebrate Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature I turned over to Brother Tommy. I hope you all have a merry, merry, merry Christmas. And if I don't see you, a wonderful, happy new year. And I pray that something I said hit you, that if you want joy in 2024, you're going to have to rest and spend time before the Lord to get it. There's nothing in this world, all the busyness in this world is not going to give it to you.